From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. If you are listening to this show in the United States, then there's a surprising possibility that this story affects you directly in ways that you may not fully understand. Here's what happened, folks. In a previous listener mail segment, Matt, Noel, and I touched on the concept of mysterious people and communities in North America and specifically in what would later become the United States. These groups today in the world of academia are known as tri-racial isolates. Historically, they've been the subject of extensive speculation, racism, rumor mongering, and even allegations of conspiracy. So today we are diving deep into the fact, fiction, folklore, and fantasy surrounding these groups. We're exploring their mysterious origins, and we're pulling back the curtain of history to see whether we can finally determine the truth amid all these at times bizarre tall tales. Uh, Full disclosure, I am a descendant of one of the groups we're going to spend a lot of time on, the community known as the Melungeons. I will try, and no doubt fail, not to be biased. (laughs) Here are the facts. So first, we're going to travel to the eastern seaboard of these old United States, and while we're there, that's one of the reasons why we're going there, is because this phrase that you may hear, tri-racial isolate, it uh, for a long time referred to a very specific group of people, the one that Ben just mentioned, Melungeons, and there's a, well, there's a reason for that. We're going to learn about it. A tri-racial isolate is a term for a community of individuals whose ancestry is some mixture of various things, um, including African, Native American, European, uh, and other, I mean, various other sources. And it's it's almost always three, right? That's why you get tri-racial isolate. Pretty simple. Yeah. And then the isolate part comes from the fact that a lot of these groups essentially self-segregated. Um, they existed in small communities that tended to intermarry um, only with other members of their community. And uh, Ben, you point out that they kind of didn't really get out much. There's a lot of good reasons for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and we should also mention just uh, for anybody who has seen this as a video clip on YouTube or some other source, I agree it's kind of dumb to wear sunglasses inside, but I just had I just had a, a surgical procedure, so I I have to wear these part of and no Matt, part of the reason I'm wearing these is so you don't have to look at what's going on under here for, yeah. well, for a few yeah. days. <laughs> what Ben's sure not, not... going to tell you is that he just got his cybernetic eyes installed, and uh, it, it's all good. It, right. They're going to be awesome, though. Or as they call it in the crypto community, laser eyes. That's yeah. the thing. Uh, I was going to say, Ben, are you sure you didn't? Uh, you're not wearing your sunglasses inside, so we can watch you weave, then breathe your storylines. <laughs> right, because you could probably see the screen reflected here. Uh, yeah, hopefully this is a temporary thing, but that's that's what's going on. But just wanted to point out that's the lyric and I wear my sunglasses at night by Corey Hart that most people <laughs> think sounds like gibberish. And honestly, it doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. Uh, but he apparently wears his sunglasses at night so he can watch you weave, then breathe your storylines. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I was listening to that song earlier today. Uh, so no it, it, Yeah, it hits different. Uh, at least this afternoon. But you're absolutely right, Noel. The isolation part is key here. A lot of these communities began by design in isolated, somewhat inaccessible areas. You know, these were not areas with the best farmland. These were not areas with the best fishing or access to other towns. Uh, They were places that would be difficult to find unless you knew 
what you were looking for and how to get there. Melungeons are one of the most well-known examples of these triracial isolates, but they are far from the only examples. Uh, you may have been more likely to hear of a community known as the Lumbi. You may have also heard of the Brass Ankles or people who are simply referred to as the Turks. All in all, there are believed to be somewhere around 200 different groups or communities qualifying as tri-racial isolates, and they're mainly in the eastern and southern United States. It's a, it's a relatively distinct phenomenon in this country for centuries. You, you, you may not have heard of most of these groups, by the way, but for centuries, these groups were exoticized and they were considered mysterious or even in some cases capable of supernatural feats. What do we mean by that? We mean stuff like magically stopping bleeding or being able to uh, draw somehow an illness out of somebody or even being a sin eater. Ben, um, you know, growing up, being aware of this uh, part of your history, is this something that your folks told you stories about when you were young? Yes, and those stories are more prevalent in older populations. So a, a great aunt would talk about this or, or something like that. But we have to realize, you know, history is closer to the modern day than a lot of people assume. Like, this is a fun fact. Uh, no one knows how old my grandfather lived to be because the records of his birth were in a courthouse that burned down. There were a lot of burning courthouses at the time as well. So, so if you look back in your own past, you'll inevitably find questions, right, or unsolved things. And that's going to play a role in today's story as well. Uh, you know, let's let's stick with the Melungeons. So we know they're part of a, a larger phenomenon, but when we ask ourselves about any triracial isolate, whether Melungeons, Lumbi, what have you, uh, one of the first questions that pops up for a lot of people, especially their descendants, is, well, where where did they originate? Here is the legend as I've heard it. Um, Matt and Noel have each heard a version of this, uh, probably off air at our favorite local chicken wing spot or something like that. So way, way, way back in the day, once upon a time, somewhere in the 1600s, maybe somewhere in the 1700s, maybe sometime earlier, the first big wave of European colonizers were exploring the Appalachian Mountains, meaning that they were, they were looking to settle down somewhere, to find resources, not just passing through. And, and just for anyone who doesn't live in the United States, that's the large, older mountain range on the eastern side of the United States. Yes, yeah, home to the Appalachian Trail. And when these colonizers or these explorers, whatever you want to call them, were in this area of the world, this, um, what, if you look at it on a map, you'll see the state of Tennessee has an attenuated tip on the right-hand side, on the eastern side, and that connects with uh, parts of Kentucky, parts of Virginia. Anyway, these Europeans, these guys are in there, and they stumble across this kind of twilight zone. -y. They stumble across this bizarre settlement deep in what are known as the hollers or the valleys of this area. And the people they see surprise them because they have dark skin, like much darker than you would expect from, say, a European in the Mediterranean. They have, some of them have blue eyes, which is weird. Their hair is straight. Their noses are identical to those of those European explorers or similar enough. And these folks don't live in cabins. They live in longhouses. And in some versions, one version I like, they speak an archaic form of English, like uh, the kind of thing that would make you wonder whether these people were from a different era of time. This is this is funny. Maybe we maybe we can all play this game together. Uh, I, I was told a reenactment of this first contact. So the explorers come up. I don't know who wants to be an explorer. And they basically say the following. Who the hell are you? Uh, wh what do you mean? Ask the people. Well, well are, are you are you Indians? Indians? Uh, what? Well, uh, what happens if we're if we're Indians? Well, you got to get the hell out of here. Oh, oh, for real? No, no, that, no, we're not. Uh, we're not Indian. We're um. And they like looked around. They're like, uh, what? What else do? You, what else do you got? Yeah, and I, I, I would assume the uh, explorers laundry listed some other like undesirable 
uh, possibilities. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, well, you, you know, you might be Portuguese. You might be, you might be Jewish. You might be Roma, although they would have used the pejorative gypsy at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, they would have named some other things. And this game, this sort of cat and mouse game, continued for centuries because Melungeon people who often didn't know their own origin, would change the story they told outsiders whenever it was convenient. So, oh, no, we're not, you know, Native Americans. We're we're actually black. Then they came back and they said, hey, did you say this earlier thing? And they're like, oh, what? No, who told you that? I don't believe that guy. We're uh, Roma or whatever. And this was uh, this was a practice, this sort of metamorphosis, of the lie was a practice for aimed at survival. So you would discard a label when it became too dangerous, as often did. Yeah, for for my money, Ben, the way I'm seeing it, it's very similar to what we've just said here. But uh, it feels like the less they would go with whatever is the least dangerous option uh, at any given time, depending on what the the colonizers, the the white folk that are coming through, were uh, seeking or seeking to. Eradicate? <laughs> Maybe. I don't I mean there's just a subject really history there. Yeah. No, but no, yeah. it's all Ser- really, really bad and, and rife. And it was you had to kind of walk on eggshells. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And so Europeans, as every student of history knows, settle further and further inland. Uh colonial powers at the time make a couple of moves meant to originally stem this, like setting up, you know, a British zone of influence and drawing a line on a map. But a line on a map is not the same thing as a physical demarcation. So the Melungeon community becomes surrounded by other people, but still isolated. They're extremely rural. They're extremely impoverished. They're also still not of the new country that is springing up. They are not part of the United States, really. And and their day-to-day life doesn't doesn't really change. So this is a funny story. This mix-up and this like, oh, we're Portuguese, LOL. This kind of stuff is a tall tale, but it has a little bit of fact mixed in. And it's true that various authors over time describe triracial isolates uh, like the Melungeons as any number of things, usually because they had their own kind of badger in the bag here and say, oh, they're Portuguese. No, wait, says another author. They're actually Turkish. No, wait, says another author. They're a lost tribe of Israel. Hear me out. You know what I mean? And what, they're descendants of mysterious shipwrecks from the ancient era of the Phoenicians. Like Phoenicians were legendary sailors, right? Uh, so the, this, it, based entirely on that fact, some guy was like, oh, yeah, I could be, they're Phoenicians, though, if you think about it. Those are the ones that were really good at pronouncing words, right? Just based on the spelling? Yes. Yep, that's them. Uh, They are also the inventors of the letter P and the letter H. Matt Matt is shaking his head hard at that one. (laughs) My (laughs) part of it. My part of it. Not your factual part, Ben. Oh, no, that's, uh, I think, I think all we can agree that is entirely factual, at least... (laughs) You know, that would that would fly for a fact in the world of uh, early Melungeon communities. And, and the thing is, aha, aha. If, if you went back in time and you told somebody in, in this area of the world, you met a you met a Melungeon and you said, you're a Melungeon, it would be fighting words. It was a pejorative. It was an insult. It was not it was it was not cool. You know what I mean? It wasn't like saying, hey, you're um, an Atlantan or something like that. It was much closer to a racially derogatory term. And and, and similarly to other racially derogatory terms we know, uh, it would eventually go on to become a word used to self-identify and kind of take back those negative connotations. But we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah. And and first, we have to figure out where that word comes from, because if you've never heard it before, it sounds... Strange, like is it a Native American word, or did some European get really mad at somebody for stealing chickens, which happened a lot? That happened to my family too. Uh, and then they, did they just get at a loss of? Uh, uh, did they get so upset that they were at a loss for words? Beat me here, Paul. But were they trying to like call someone a mother? And they're like you, London. 
And, and they that, were just yeah too hopped up on the on the moonshine and they slurred a little bit. <laughs> right. Let's get all the stereotypes in there. Yes. It it uh it's weird because a lot of people tried to guess at this phrase, at this etymology, and they found some interesting things or interesting ideas, but again, none of them have been conclusively proven. Yeah, and it's because they don't all seem to be a perfect fit, right? Like, I think the one that makes a lot of sense to me is the French word melange, which you you might know is just like a mixture, like a potpourri, you know, various ingredients um, that you can ref- you can use that word uh, in terms of literature or any other thing. But it would also be like maybe culinary. Um, it also could potentially have linguistic roots in the phrase melon can, which is a Turkish expression referring to something possessed, you know, something not of this earth, a cursed soul, perhaps. Yeah, that's not a great look. Who are, who are you people? We're the cursed. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but then also you've got thrown in there, you know, words that go back or words that mean things like eggplant that just sound kind of similar with the with the melongia or melangina. Uh, it, you know, it, it's a bit strange. It's a bit strange because that one in particular would just be referring to, uh, quote, dark skin on on somebody. Does that does that come from melanin, do you think? Like or, or do you think melanin comes from that etymologically, the pigment that makes for dark skin? Yeah, that's a That's a good question. I know that the it comes from melanin comes from the Greek. So melas or melan meaning black. Right. Mm-hmm. So it. It could be a common, it could be a common phrase there, uh, and we know that there was a pretty diverse mix of languages in this in this time period in this part of the world, like the Panoply of native languages that existed, and all the languages that uh, immigrants brought over when they crossed the Atlantic. the The one that was interesting. Too, I think this stood out for you as well, Noel, was the idea that it somehow, the phrase somehow implied jin, D-J-I-N-N. And for anyone who hasn't read it, either in the title or description of this episode, Melungeon is spelled M-E-L-U-N-G-E-O-N. And the concept of it, the way it sounds at the very end of that word, Melungeon, oh, I can yeah. totally see why that would may fit there and also why you may have some beliefs in supernatural abilities of somebody who's been labeled this. And anyone that listens to the show, I'm sure knows the concept of gin, but just as a refresher, it would be a malevolent spirit, you know, but also has been kind of incorporated into the idea of genies or like wish granting, perhaps more benevolent spirits. But usually there's a bit of a monkey's paw bargain in, in those uh, wish scenarios. One of three intelligent life forms created by, Allah, right? The there are the angels, and then there are the humans, and then there are the jinn, which are crafted from smokeless fire. It's a it's a fascinating story, and um, there is a wonderful podcast on our network, a pure podcast, which is all about jinn, which I believe you EP'd, Matt. Correct? Yes, it's fantastic. Uh, it was created with the help of Aaron Mankey, the guy who made lore. It's called the Hidden Jinn. So here we are. We're about 20 minutes into the show, and I have been somewhat uh, indirectly accused of being Jin. Well, I, I mean, think, that's why hey, we summon you hey. all. You know, dude, come on. That's why there's this whole history. Of, it's part of the of lore. Your powers, uh, man. That's so kind, you guys. It's um, It fits with the sunglasses, right? Because if you've seen American <laughs> Gods, the Jin character in there has to wear sunglasses all the time. Because, because he has fiery pupils, right? If right. If he took the sunglasses off, there would be like, it would, it would be a dead giveaway. Exactly. Zero smoke. Where zero smoke, smokeless fire. Whereas I'm much more in a um, ocular phantom of the opera situation. So we'll <laughs> keep this a little more dilated than fire. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep this in. Uh, we'll keep this on for everybody. Uh, but the thing is, none of these explanations have been proven. Any of the explanations we just outlined, and none of them really answer the question that we posed at the top. Where did the Melungeons come from? We're going to pause for a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. Here's where it gets crazy. Well, the way I always learned it is the answer to where do Melungeons come from is Hancock County, Tennessee. And there are like two other counties, and there are a couple of families that are thought to be Melungeon. 
But that's not the that's not really what people mean when they ask that question. It's like if you have if you have grown up in the US and you are from a multiracial or mixed family, then one of the dumb questions you have to put up with is someone saying, "Where are you from?" and then you say, "Okay, I'm from I'm from Los Angeles, bro. I don't know what you want me to tell you." <laughs> it's interesting here, though, because, I mean, with those kinds of questions, you're referring to a very long history. With this, you're referring to a handful of families, like you said, in a very isolated community over. It's almost like a modern religion, you know, like being a Mormon or something. It's like it's not ancient. It's much more contemporary. And Ben, if I'm not mistaken, one of the families, uh, I believe it's pronounced Boland, not Bolin like your name, but it's uh, more of a D sound. There are a couple. So. The problem there is the illiteracy that was widespread at the time. So I'm related, for example, the last name Bullen, I am related to people who spelled it differently because they were all kind of freestyling based on how they thought the name would look on paper. So there are Bullens, there are Collins, there are Collinses, excuse me, they're Goins. Uh, these are names that you'll hear brought up pretty often. Uh and for many, many years, at least in the case of Melungeons, they were, like you said, Matt, they were considered something old, something from far beyond the days of the 13 colonies in the United States, and that is not entirely inaccurate. Uh, the, 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 the thing that gets me is it feels like that, that first contact legend I heard feels very much like an episode of a, of a science fiction show, or it feels like something you might see at the beginning of a horror story. And in, in the, in, back in the day, before it was okay to be Melungeon, they were often treated like something out of an H.P. Lovecraft story, you know, like something not, not entirely human. Now that I think about it, I don't know that I've seen one walking on a Sunday. <laughs> Pretty sure I saw one levitating <laughs> the other day, round back behind the barn. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it was even worse than that. It was they were used as a as one of these creatures, like the duende, when we talked about those and the goblins on that episode, or uh, when we talk about some of the old witch stories that we brought up on that episode as well. They were used as a thing to essentially fear when you like as a, a folklore fairy tale that you would tell your children, perhaps if you lived in a surrounding area, um, literally don't go into the woods. The Melungeons might get you right. Yeah, like a bit of a boogeyman or even like, but beyond that more on a sociological level, kind of scapegoats in the same way that witches were used to blame, uh, to have something to point to when things went badly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is weird because this, this stuff, which is a, an iteration of very, very old folkloric beliefs common in common on the African continent, common in Europe, wherever you go, any place that has people will have these kind of boogeymen. Mm -hmm. And this, they have, Melungeons happen to be a very easy, like regional flavor for that same fear. Uh, but at the same time, we see the modern U.S. state evolving the, the modern country of the U.S. The first Tennessee Constitution, which is written way back in 1796, uh, gave male free people of color the right to vote. A lot of folks don't know that. Uh, and it, it didn't last forever because after the rebellion led by Nat Turner in 1831, Tennessee went back and, and changed things. But that does mean Technically, if you want to be a lot of fun at parties, you can say the Melungeons were some of the first free people of color to vote, at which point your friends will stare at you blankly and then say, has anybody listened to Donda yet? <laughs> it's pretty okay. Um, uh, is that because they could pass for white, Ben? In some cases, not not in the beginning and not not for a long time, actually, but they definitely did not. They didn't look like anyone else, you know. Uh, this is part of why there was such mystery and so much folklore about the community. It wasn't entirely kind. You can read a lot of it in, there are several books out, but I, I just be very careful about their credibility because some of those books, especially the older ones, uh, we'll get to why they have their, 
those books have problems. But yes, people were accused of witchcraft. It wasn't just, don't go out in the woods at night, kiddo. The Melungeons will get you. They didn't really say what the Melungeons would do if they got you. Would they eat you? Would you have to party with them in like a Rip Van Winkle kind of style or Fun. what? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Maybe they would lock you up in their vast silver mines and or just coffers of silver that they had. Perhaps there are riddles involved? Uh, that would be great. Uh, this part of the world is and remains a, a place that puts a lot of emphasis on, on good stories and, and music and those bits of folklore. So, yeah, maybe they would have some riddles. Would the riddles make sense? I don't know. Maybe maybe not in 2021. But the let's get back on the silver hordes. Yes. <laughs> right? Uh, this is something, Matt, I don't know how much we want to talk about this. We've alluded to it on the show in the past. I think, I think we talked should. about it. We're not going to say the whole thing. There are legends of hidden silver caches and mines amongst the hills of the Appalachia that uh, allegedly someone of of Melungeon descent hid. There, there are tales of this out there, some of which have been, um, a lot more has been made of them than maybe is worth. It almost has like Lord of the Rings-esque qualities to it, like the idea of like the dwarves and their like caches of treasure that they hoard like beneath the Misty Mountain or whatever, you know? Yeah, this is, uh, this. these are very good points because... The idea, I don't know, it kind of metastasized the way that a lot of a lot of these stories do, but the support for this idea uh, would be found in, in numerous reports that uh, some non-Melungeon person knows a Melungeon person, right? Their community is several miles over or whatever, and one day this person who is from a community that is just as poor as everybody else. There were not a very, there were not very many well-to-do people in that in that community. Uh, all of a sudden, they show up and they've got like silver coins or buttons, and that's what they're paying for stuff with instead of like ginseng or whatever you know would have been foraged. And that would have been a time where like that kind of trade was acceptable. Like there wasn't like necessarily you know um, legal tender that they were always using. It could have been more on barter systems in this rural parts of the country but silver to barter i mean good on you good you're good barter i mean you should get a lot from the from the general store for like an ancient piece of silver one would think yeah and it's also a a weird flex that could work against you i mean it's kind of like going to your local gas station and then getting you know uh, a cup of coffee for what like a dollar 35 and then paying for it with a hundred dollar bill Sure. It's like when they when they tell you if you've done a big heist or something or like done some sort of crime, don't go spreading your money around because you're going to draw attention to yourself. Yeah. Don't don't whip out the the Ben Bucks when all you need to pay for is some coffee. <laughs> right. Right. People will be suspicious. And one of the reasons people were suspicious about uh, this silver mine story or the secret hoard of silver was that there was, there were already rumors that something like this existed and they became connected to Melungeons because of that report of someone who was expected to be impoverished suddenly seeming to have a lot of wealth. Was it due to their infernal powers or was it due to um, their perceived close friendship with native populations or did they know some kind like you this is what people forget even back then in like the 1700s folks were practicing a kind of belief in ancient hidden history you know what i mean like the idea that when you hear somebody saying well you know actually the um, insert group here you know they could say oh actually you know the uh templars came over uh, way, way, way before your history books want you to know that Europeans visited the quote-unquote new world. People were saying stuff like that back then, too, <laughs> and they and they believed it. And Ben, I, I just want to walk back something I said earlier slightly. I, I, I said how this might be looked at as maybe more of a modern thing um, as opposed to like races that maybe have existed for thousands of years. Uh, that's maybe more how we would see it today, but the people of the time – 
were looking at it through a lens of superstition and they were looking at them as like these ancient beings almost, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is a symptom of othering, you know, of saying these people look a little too different from us to be, you know, maybe they look too different to actually be people. So the thing is, there is a, a legend of a silver mine in that area and it's an old legend. It's called Swift's Silver Mine uh, and the it, the reason it is thought to exist is because of the journal of an Englishman named Jonathan Swift. He claims that he discovered this mine, and the legend goes uh, he was making bank off of it until things went wrong. The money got too good. He ended up walling it up. He betrayed somebody or was betrayed in turn. He was stricken blind, perhaps by an act of God, and unable to return to the mine. People still celebrate this. Uh, they conjecture over whether it's in Tennessee or Virginia. The, I believe there's like an annual celebration for the mine. There are people who are looking for it as we speak. But uh, Jonathan Swift, if you if you dig into his story, it, he's a Kaiser Soze man. He's a ghost. This isn't the Jonathan Swift who wrote Gulliver's Travels, though, who maybe no. was of the same era, but it's just a, a very arresting name. I know. I wish it was him, though. That would give us more to go on, right? <laughs> Everybody in uh, Jonathan Swift book is based on his encounters in the U.S. That would be great. Uh, but I like that you mentioned authors, Noel, because now we're going back to the idea that each new author seems to be purposely playing the game of telephone. And they're playing it on 11, on a scale of 1 to 10. Nobody can just say, hey, I'm confirming this person's theory, and I think this sounds good. Everybody's got to have their own thing, you know what I mean? And so they add more and more layers to the overall myth, and that's where we see some really wild claims start to come about. Sure. We have authors like David Beers Quinn and Ivor Noel Hume, who um, conjectured that the Melungeons were descended from Sephardi Jews who fled the Spanish Inquisition and came uh, to North America as sailors. Um, there's also whispers around this time saying that the uh, great explorer Francis Drake didn't actually repatriate all of the Turks that he saved from the sack of Cartagena, but in fact, uh, some came along with him to the colonies. Okay, so we got Drake in here. Will we see some Melungeons in the next Uncharted game? Did you guys play Uncharted? I did. I didn't finish the most recent one, but those are epically great games. All right, so I expect a royalty check in the mail. Uh, <laughs> if they if they do that, I don't think they have to pay. No, I don't think so, because then they have to pay everybody else, right? I don't think video game companies pay reparations. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I was looking for royalties. Well, dream big. Uh, there are any number of other suggestions. They're largely from what could be described as uh, authors who are running the gamut between self-educated to scholarly, between amateur to uh, someone with personal first-hand experience because they have family members who told them some of these stories. The first most popular theory about the Melungeons was that they were the descendants of, uh, of some Europeans who came over way, way, way before Europeans officially reached the U.S. and then uh, people of the Cherokee Nation. This is almost certainly false as an origin story, and we'll see why in a moment. If you put all the myths aside, and they're so cool, and I wish some of them were true, you know what I mean? I would love to be able to, like, give people the evil eye or to, you know, stop someone's bleeding or stop their heart with just, like, some, I don't know, some weird incantation. The poison fingers? The Poison Fingers. Ew. I thought that, that was, was a good, Frederick clan. That was a good sound stinger. You did right there, man. <laughs> I just watched a great movie. I think it was on Netflix about that. I felt it. I felt okay. the sting. Poison Fingers? As a kung fu movie. Uh, anyway. I <laughs> one of those the movies name of where it. you can stop someone's heart by like, do, 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 like just tapping on their chest. Like, oh, no, it's fast. a single strike right on the back. <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, and now there's some style on it next one. <laughs> is, is it a death blow? A death it blow? is, yeah, but it takes <laughs> a it. second to kick in. Of course. Ah, so if you put all the myths aside, 
Melungeons did, and in some cases still do, look physically distinct from their neighbors in this, again, this little pocket of Appalachia. And that means that regardless of how much they attempted to culturally assimilate, going to Christian churches, uh, participating in public works, whatever, those physical differences meant the rumors and the persecution against these communities, and again, other communities like them, other triracial isolates, would continue. So over time, Melungeons began to purposely assimilate on a deeper level. They were attempting to marry and interbreed outside of their own communities with existing European-American populations. And it used to be just, you know, the people that they met. You met someone, you fell in love, you didn't think too much about what social class or hierarchy meant. But this, this change means that they were attempting to escape or hide their origin or identity. And again, the origin story was itself a conspiracy. It would always change when it was convenient or necessary. So you probably haven't heard of these folks before, of triracial isolates, unless you grew up around one of these communities or you yourself are a member of one of these communities. And the reason you haven't heard a lot of those odd stories are, first, these are often disadvantaged populations. Secondly, they're often very small in number. And third, they don't really fit into the kind of cut-and-dry textbook history of the U.S. as taught in schoolrooms. For a very long time, U.S. history was taught in terms of absolutes. You know what I mean? Uh, We're the good guys. These dates happened And this is why this thing is important. And we've only got time for one paragraph on this, so we're moving on. You know what I mean? And this means that amateur researchers didn't have much to go on for a long time except disparate clues and records in courthouses that didn't burn down, oral tradition, which (laughs) has a lot of BS in it. Uh, And then while they were trying to unravel the mystery, their process eventually and inevitably led to two very, very big problems. The first one we've already kind of discussed here, the triracial isolate groups were often attempting to hide their true identity for one reason or another, uh, usually because of persecution from an outside group. So, you know, they're all those records, if you can't find them, are going to be kind of hidden hidden away uh, amongst other identities right other whether it's um, racial and identifying identities or names that are different or changed it's just it's something that's very difficult to to pin down i i think i'm getting that right ben maybe i'm wrong but i it feels as though that's one of the most difficult things is that the paperwork becomes muddy well yeah and think like i Someone who, let's say someone's interviewing a person who is Melungeon, but they've they've cast it away. It's before the 1960s when it when the word uh, became okay and became not an insult, due primarily to one stage play. But story for another day. If you're trying to talk to someone about this because you're researching it, and they don't want to talk to you because they're like, you know, me and my parents and my grandparents actually spent a long time trying to get away from that. So if we could keep all our questions to the album, I don't know, I guess they made an album or something. Uh, but this assimilation continued. People wanted to pass as quote unquote white and things like my freckles could be considered physical proof of this assimilation, uh, but that's that's one that's one problem. That's a very real problem. But we shouldn't ignore the second leviathan of a problem, which is that many of these researchers had something we talk about pretty often on the show. They had heavy confirmation bias. Like, let's say you're writing a book and you say, you know, I heard there was Turkish descent involved, or I being a student of Phoenician history, I'm certain that Melungeons, what we call Melungeons today, are actually Phoenician. And I am going to not discover the truth, but I am going to prove that this is so. And this means that they would, you know, they would cherry pick stuff that, you know, that seemed to enforce their narrative or strengthen it. But on the flip side, especially people thought they were descended from Melungeons, we have to keep in mind uh, these people have 
created their own narrative that's very close to them. And so they might avoid answers that make them uncomfortable. There was literally the stuff they didn't want themselves to know about, you know, themselves. Right. Yeah. We're going to a, uh, this is where we go to the next most recent big turn. I think you can see what we're telegraphing here, folks. Definitely better than I can. Fast forward to the advent of commercial DNA technology. This Now it is possible you can spit into a cup. You can swab the inside of your cheek and you can learn all sorts of things about the people who ultimately led to you spending time here on Earth. So we rarely get to say this on our show, but it's official. The mystery of the Melungeons is solved. Problem is, a ton of people do not like the answer. We'll tell you why after a word from our sponsor. Hey, and we're back. And I don't know if any of you caught that, but Ben threw shade at his own eyes while wearing shades at night. It was beautiful. Dude, my... I'm going to be honest with you. Like, if it looks like it, I'm crying, my eyes are just leaking. I'm not, like, emotionally. I'm potato, fine. potato, my friend. Potato, <laughs> <Okay>. potato. <sighs> <sighs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, we keep using this term, Melungeon, and it is a bit strange that we're even using it this often in an episode of a podcast because it did have such a negative connotation for so long, but it turns out this word that was a pejorative, it wasn't really based in science in any way. No. Well, not, no. Yeah. Not, and neither were many of the other ones that you mentioned at the top of the show, Ben. Um, those are all in various ways and by various people used as terms of abuse and often just catch alls for biracial people. You know, when where they don't like the people that are slinging these insults around aren't doing it because they care whether a person identifying as Melungeon thinks that they're from Portuguese descent. They just look at them as this other that looks different. And this is a term of abuse, much like the term red bone in Cajun kind of culture would be used as a term for, you know, biracial people. And that's another term that was taken back by those that would identify as such. Also, the f- word melungeon has the added disadvantage of just being an awkward clunky word linguistically you know what why couldn't we be witch breed that's way cooler <laughs> that's <laughs> cool <laughs> but it's cool no one no one asked us but uh so melungeons back in the day and their modern descendants they're the first the idea of a, a scientific term here is a bit of a moving goalpost because I was trying to think about how to say this without being defense, without offending anybody. But, uh, you know, we're big on comic book and fiction analogies here on stuff they don't want you to know. And there is in the world of Marvel Universe something called the deviance. Uh, if, you, if you're not too familiar with this, they're wrapped up in the Eternals. You'll see Deviants in the upcoming Marvel movie, The Eternals. But the thing about Deviants in the comic book is that, in the comic book universe, is that none of them look exactly alike. The main thing they have in common is that they are collectively called Deviants. Uh, Legend people are not Deviants. People in general are not Deviants, you know. Uh, they're all people. Uh, but the group described as Melungeons, they don't have the same level of genetic homogeneity that you would see in, say, the Han Chinese, right? Uh, they wouldn't, because they are the result of so many mixtures of people from a widespread variety of places across the world, the odds are pretty high that each family has its own unique genetic lineage. So, DNA testing was for the first time in history able to conclusively trace the roots of some core families that founded what would have become known as, you know, Melungeons today or Melungeon country. And a lot of people who proudly considered themselves in Melungeons in East Tennessee and Virginia and parts of Kentucky uh, were dead set on seeing their family story proven true. 
You know, oh, we do trace back to some mysterious hinterland of the Ottoman Empire. Oh, we are actually the descendants of uh, some people Francis Drake rescued, or we are secretly from the lost tribe of Israel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, no, you can trace the Melungeons back. It starts in Virginia. It starts a long time ago in Virginia, uh, like in the well, 1500s of Virginia, which to your point, Noel, is still comparatively recent. Sure, and, and they can trace it back to a specific area of Virginia, the Tidewater region, I guess, of Virginia. And there are multiple um, pretty substantial studies that uh, prove this. Um, most famously, there was a relatively recent DNA study in the Journal of Genetic Genealogy. Uh, the lead researcher of that study, Roberta Estes, and her team found that there was genetic evidence that proves the families historically called Melungeons um, are mostly the offspring of sub-Saharan African men and white women of northern or central European origin. That's the part that kind of pissed some people off because I think a lot of folks really hung on to that Portuguese part of it? Yeah, it's the it's the U.S. There were a lot of people, as, as terrible as it is, uh, that took this news poorly because they were offended by the idea that they could be in any way black. Because that's where they were in life. So it, it, so Estes dealt with this, and they, they theorized that various Melungeon lines could have sprung up like they said, the gen the genetic proof is there from unions of indentured servants, black and white indentured servants who were living in Virginia until the mid-1600s when some very important legal things happened and some very unclean legal things. We're talking about the practice, the widespread practice of chattel slavery. And they note, the researchers note that as laws were put into place in, uh, slowly over a period of time, uh, like the old adage about boiling frogs, uh, these laws increasingly penalized people for doing for practicing what was called miscegenation. Which what is was the, the big one that that was uh, overturned with Loving versus West Virginia? Miscegenation. Yeah, well, having, the, the, the name of the law though it was like uh, it was something like the Racial Purity Act or something really awful sounding like that. Uh, it's terrible to say, but there there are so many. And these were going like colony by colony, state by state. Um, so the various family groups that existed as their existence was being made illegal could only intermarry with each other. And eventually they started migrating away. Because if you don't like the law in one place then, or you don't agree with it and you can leave, then why on earth would you stay? Especially if you know it's going to impact the lives of your children. So they migrated centuries and centuries and centuries ago from Virginia through the Carolinas before settling primarily in the mountains of East Tennessee. Why did they seem so well established when other Europeans came? Right. That's that's a question for a different day, because the, those other explorers probably weren't aware of what what happened that led these people to live there. And the claims of things like Portuguese ancestry were just a, a ruse. They're a conspiracy because they wanted to remain free, even if they were called free people of color. The most important part of that phrase to them was the one at the beginning, free. And they also wanted to retain social privileges that would come with the idea of passing. And so in short, they were trying to cover up part of their collective past. In most cases, they were trying to cover up African ancestry. And that conspiracy, as crazy as it sounds, worked incredibly well for a long time. Like, it, it worked. They were considered different. And also, yes, it does sound silly to want to cover up something like that because, as we all know, science proves that if you are a human being, then your ancestors ultimately originated from the African continent. Yeah, and it's not difficult to to know why, right? Why why would a large group of people conspire to hide their identity? Because it does not take much at all to crack open even a, a history book that's sanctioned by the United States and the Departments of Education and see the atrocities, the crimes that were committed against anyone who was not, let's just say it, white enough within the colonies. And uh, and in the early United States, even before it was a country, right? As as things were just being settled and colonized, um, there's very good reason to want to, as you said, Ben, pass 
for something that of uh, something other. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, travel back to even as recently as the early 1800s in this part of the world and say that you are Melungeon. What would you do to give your kids a better shot at success in life? For most people, the answer is, and it should be, uh, virtually anything I can do is so, what I will do. And this ruse, this conspiracy was so successful that over generations, actual Melungeons fell for the story, once meant to protect them from outsiders. You can't tell me we're not Turkish, etc., etc. And oral traditions and folklore are fascinating, and they are often based in some grain of truth, but DNA is solid evidence. It can't be ignored. The mystery is solved, and those who claim it is not either have their own unique non melungeon family history, or they may simply not want to admit the truth. The pattern of hiding from the past, even when it becomes apparent, that you're doing so is sadly, it's not unique to Melungeons. It's not unique to triracial isolates. It's not unique to the United States. It is an important lesson. Is the ultimate takeaway from this mystery is, I think, I'm trying to be positive here. I think in some ways it's inspiring. And uh, Matt, I think we found the perfect person to give us the last word on what we can take away from this episode, the mystery of the Melungeons. That recent DNA study that we mentioned earlier, which you can read about, by the way, if you look to the Associated Press and Travis Lawler, uh, you can find this. And, uh, I would type this into your search bar. A whole lot of people upset about upset by this study <laughs> <laughs> uh, or DNA and the truth about Appalachia's melungeons. So there was this this DNA study we talked about, and there was some response to it. There's a sociologist named G. Reginald Daniel who spent much of his life, around three decades, uh, just studying this this whole thing, multiracial communities within the United States. And this is his quotation. Quote, all of us are multiracial. And this study is recapturing a more authentic United States history. Well said. Yeah. And it's, it, and it's a mission that everybody should be on board with. You know, there's, there's this tendency that happens, not with everybody, but as people age and as they begin considering their mortality more often or more deeply, uh, their interest in the past also increases. I'm sure everybody listening can think of one older relative who got super into genealogy right? And maybe learned some amazing things. And you may have found yourself going on a journey like this. It is a, a noble undertaking, and it's something that those who come after you will appreciate in their own time. And with this in mind, we pass the torch to you, or we put a badger in a bag and we toss it to you. <laughs> what, what do you think? Do you have any multiracial background in your family? And if so, did it surprise you? How was it handled? What do stories like this make you think about what we have yet to learn about the past of the U.S. and uh, what this could mean for the future? Please let us know. We can't wait to hear from you. We try to be easy to find online. That's true. You can find us on the Internet. We are Conspiracy Stuff on YouTube. We're Conspiracy Stuff on Facebook and Twitter. We're Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. And you can also give us a good old-fashioned telephone call. That's right. 1-833-STDWYTK. That's the number. Leave your name. Not your real name, though. A cool nickname that we can call you. That's the best way to do it. You've got three minutes. Use them as your own however you wish. Uh, if you've got more to say than can fit into those three minutes, we highly recommend you send us an email. Our address is conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.